Um, today I want to talk about dealing with bad behavior, and I don't mean our own bad behavior, but I mean when we're sometimes offended by others and their bad behavior out in the world. Uh, we pick up any newspaper, of course, most people don't pick up newspapers these days. Most people uh, go on their phone, look at a news app, but if you scroll down through any of the uh, news articles, sooner or later, usually at the very first one, and then the second one, and the third one, it's somebody doing either something bad to another person or doing something good to another person. The government doing something that's not for the best of the people. The government doing something that is good for the people. An or organization or a corporation doing something that's not good. You know, maybe with a pollution or, or the water supply or some other thing or prices. Or an individual even sometimes doing something harmful to another individual. For some offenses, there are laws against such things. And sometimes, on rare occasions, uh, people go to court over those laws, whether civil or, or criminal. And sometimes uh, they have to pay a fine or they get put in jail and so on. But for other things, there are no laws. They're just uh, social conventions or local rules and regulations, like somebody cutting in line in front of you after you've been waiting for almost an hour. And you think, well, that's not right, that's not fair. But there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's just one of those things. Or rarely is there anything we can do about it. Getting justice has never, in the history of humanity, been an easy thing. And there's a reason. Human nature. Human nature is such that we all sometimes do things that are not in the best interest of the people around us. And so when someone does it to us, we don't complain too loudly because sometimes we want to do it to them as well. If you want to speed in your car, if that's your normal thing, going five or 10 miles over the speed limit, why would you vote for more traffic cops on the street? <laughs> that would seem like you were working against your own best interests. So justice from that perspective is difficult and it's also human nature to be self-interested. We uh, want something, Somebody or something is in our way, and we want to remove that, sometimes not in the most polite manner. So it's just human nature. So justice is a hard thing. It's something you have to struggle for. Society has to struggle for, day in and day out. Jesus told a parable about this. I'm going to turn over to Luke 18 and read that. <clears throat> Luke 18, starting in verse 1. The parable of the persistent widow is what I have here. When Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So the author of Luke, which is Luke, uh, who also wrote the book of Acts, has decided that the reason that Jesus told this parable is to show people to, that they should always pray, pray, pray about everything. So here's the parable. He said... In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. So this judge is just, he doesn't care what anyone thinks, uh, except maybe the people who appointed him to be a judge. And he doesn't fear God, he doesn't fear retribution, he just does whatever is best for him in carrying out his duties. And there was a widow in that town, and the reason a widow is probably selected by Christ, because here is something, someone who is in this society, in Jesus' society, powerless. She may have a little money, but she doesn't have a husband to protect her. Maybe she doesn't have children to take care of her. She doesn't have somebody to be her advocate. She's on her own, you see. So only she can go personally to the judge. There was a widow that, in that town that kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Someone has done her an injustice. And she wants retribution, or she wants it to be fixed, or she wants this person to do the right thing. And she's, she's taken it to the judge. For some time he refused, because why would he care? He's the kind of person who does not care. There's no benefit to him. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. He's worried of being attacked, according to Jesus. He's worried that 
that if he keeps on doling out injustice, sooner or later, the people or somebody or maybe this widow is not going to be happy with him anymore and he's not going to be a judge or he's going to be attacked or maybe his own life is in danger. So he decides, well, I'll go ahead and give her justice. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will, God bring, and will God not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that everyone, that they get justice and quickly. So if you stop right there, it just says, listen, if the judge, judge who is, is dishonest will finally give you justice. What do you think about God, who is, ju- is, who is honest and faithful? Is he going to give us justice if we cry out to him? And he says, absolutely he's going to, and he's going to do it very quickly as well. But then he says something a little strange. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What does that have to do with the parable about justice? What does that have to do about parable about crying out to God against injustice? What does faith have to do with justice? Faith, by its very nature, is loving. Faith, by its very nation, nature, is just. And the, and the word just is synonymous with the word righteous. We sometimes don't think that. The word righteous and the word just, or justice and righteousness, are the same word. They're synonymous. You can flip them interchangeably in any sentence, in the Bible, that is, the Bible meaning. Faith, by its very nature, nature cannot tolerate injustice. And faith, by its very nature, cannot turn a blind eye to injustice. Why do we know this? Because 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God is faithful. God is faithful. And God is just. And God does not turn a blind eye to injustice. And God by his very nature, is loving. God is love. And I think we're going to actually read that verse a little bit later. So we see that faith and justice and love are interchangeable to some degree. They're interrelated to the point where you can't have one without the other. So that's why he says at the end, will I find faith? Or maybe he could have easily said, will I find love? Will I find justice? Will I find people crying out for justice? Or will I find them just turning a blind eye and pretending that it doesn't exist? Injustice. The message of the prophets and the message of Jesus Christ is this. God hates injustice. In 2 Chronicles 9.17 it says, Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. In Job 5.16 it says, so the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. And I want to turn over and read Isaiah 58, which is all about uh, justice and injustice. Starting in verse 1, shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to the people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation who does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions. They come to me as if I were a judge and say, please help me against my adversary like the widow did, and seem eager for God to come near. We have fasted, they say, and you have not seen it. We have, we have humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed, they say to God. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit your workers. So on the day that they fast, they are unjust to the people around them. In this case, they exploit their, work, their workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. They say they want justice, but then they go around striking each other with wicked fists. That's not just. You, can, you cannot fast as you do today and, accept, and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? 
Is it, is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? He goes on to say, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice? So it's justice that's God seeking, and justice in our fast, and justice in our calling out to him, first in our own lives, so that he will hear our voice when we call out about injustice against us. To and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness or your justice, if you will, will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, on the, uh, and, I, uh, and the Lord will answer. You will cry out for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your light will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide your ways. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will build the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets and dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by, going your own, uh, by not going your own way, not doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God sends his prophets to cry out for justice. He says, do not come to me with your fast, do not come to me with your prayers, do not come to me with your requests, do not come to me with your offerings, until you first provide justice to the people around you in your own lives. Then he will hear your cries of injustice and will come to your aid quickly. So, the question Jesus asked point blank, when I return, will I find anyone who is just? Will I find anyone who is righteous? Will I find anyone is, who is faithful? We begin to understand. Faith is not, I believe in Jesus. Faith is, I love my neighbor as myself. I do no harm to my neighbor, and I help my neighbor in whatever way I can, and I cry out to the Lord for, about injustice whenever I see injustice. That's faith. That's the faith, that's the fasting, that's the Sabbath that God wants from us. Love and justice. How then should we respond to bad behavior? If faith abhors bad behavior, what does our response look like? The normal human response is to fight fire with fire. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So if you do wrong to me, I do wrong to you. If you do right to me, I do right to you. That's just the way life goes. That's the way we are. Fire with fire. To defeat them, we have to play their game. If I point a finger at somebody, I've got, as the old saying goes, three pointing back at me. And that's okay, because I'll be like you in order to beat you at your own game. That's the normal human response. Until we're all alike, we're all bad actors in the same bad play. But that isn't what God wants to us. Jesus speaks against that response. Under no circumstances are we to be like him. I'm going to turn over to Matthew 5. And this is from the Sermon on the Mount, and I think you already know which one I'm going to read. Uh, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 38. The title above this section is Eye for Eye. There's my stand going down a little bit. Eye for Eye. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. 
But I tell you, that's not the right way. That's what he's going to say. I'm just paraphrasing just for a minute because I want you to think that as I read it. I, I'm telling you that's not the right way. But wait a minute. Isn't that God's law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth? Isn't that what God told the Israelites through Moses? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth? Is Jesus changing something here? Yes, he's changing something here. He's saying that's the normal human way, but there's a better way. Here's what he says. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants, wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not harm, do no harm from the one who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Let me read on. Love your enemies. He follows it up immediately. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? In other words, if you love me, I love you. If you hate me, I hate you. He says, there's no reward in that. Are, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only the, your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the only response, that is the only solution to injustice, is love, truth, and prayer. It's not get back at them for, for doing injustice to me. Jesus makes that very clear in, in language that couldn't be any clearer, I don't think. And we've all read that. And I know that's not the, the normal, natural, instinctual response when somebody harms us or does us wrong. But Jesus says we have to do it a different way. But why? I'm not above questioning Jesus at all. If God tells me to do something, I, I'm pretty much, why? Why do I have to do that, God? And I, don't, and I think there's plenty of precedent in the Old Testament for that. Moses, for instance. Moses, I need you to go back to the Israelites. Whoa, God, not me. I can't speak well. I don't have any power. They hate me. They're going to kill me. I'm not going. A lot, of, a lot of people have questioned why. So why does Jesus want us to do this this way? Doesn't punishing bad behavior eradicate it? If you spank a child for doing something you told them not to do, don't they think twice before they do it again? Does it not work if we find somebody, whip somebody, or incarcerate somebody to stop bad behavior? Does it not put a stop to it? Is it not a deterrent? It might. We know that it does sometimes. Uh, we might feel better about it. We might call it justice. It might act as a deterrent going forward. It could. However, there's something that it does not do. It does not change a person's heart. If I speed and get a ticket, I might think twice about speeding again, but it doesn't make me think, oh, I really shouldn't speed. No, it just makes me angry that I got a ticket and had to pay it, you see, if, that, if I'm a speeder. The same way, criminals get caught, they don't think, wow, I, I, I've done wrong, I should repent. That's not what they think. They think, that was terrible that I got caught, next time I won't get caught. It does not change a person's heart to punish them for the bad things that they do. Only love changes a person's heart. Something force and opposition cannot do. And we should understand that with children. How many children have grown up to be adults that behave badly and we instantly think to ourselves, perhaps they weren't loved as a child. How many, how many children grow up to be such wonderful pillars of the community and we say to ourselves, their parents must have raised them right. They must have been raised in a loving family. We understand intuitively that love, the response to love is love. We understand intuitively that when someone loves us, it makes us want to be better people. And we, we use that with our children in loving them and caring for them, hoping they'll grow up to be good, good people. It's the same with adults. There's no difference. Only love can transform us into loving people. Lack of love has turned many children to destructive habits. Here's what, first, what John said in 1 John 4. 
God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Literally, if we want to be in Christ, we have to love. Or we're not in Christ. Literally, if we want the Holy Spirit and, and, and Christ and God the Father to be in our lives, we have to love. Or he's not going to be there. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And there's a colon there. In this world, we are like Jesus. Why, why do we have confidence that we're going to heaven? Because in this world, we are like Jesus. We are loving like Jesus. We are forgiving like Jesus. We are compassionate and gentle like Jesus. And so we, so we, we look at ourselves in the mirror and we go, I'm loving and compassionate and forgiving. I'm like Jesus, and therefore I have confidence on the day of judgment. That's what John says here. There is no fear in love. The perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one whose fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And that's the verse I want to concentrate on. We love because he first loved us. That's why we love. And that's why somebody out there who's, who's being unjust with you will also love. When somebody cuts in line in front of you, say, say oh, please, go ahead of me. No problem. Not sarcastically, of course. <laughs> in other words, if your response is love when people do things harmful to you or things you don't like, the chances are that that person will say, wow, I really should not have done that. Look at how loving and kind they are to me, and then I, I hurt them, you see. That's the response. It's not, the laws, it's not that laws and, and consequences are bad. There's nothing wrong with that. It's that they lack the power to change lives. Laws, rules, and social conventions do not make utopia. If they did, all right, there are millions and millions of laws in the world today. There's 9.8 million people incarcerated in the world today. That's a huge percentage of the world's population. It hasn't made the world a better place, if you see what I mean. It isn't a kinder world, a more loving world, a trusting world, a safer world, because we punished people and locked them up. Justice means righteousness, to make things right, true, and straight. Only love can accomplish justice. Everything else is delusion and false hope. Love is examined from many angles in Scripture. The idea of love is examined more than 600 times in the Bible from many, many different angles. That's a lot of love in the Bible. Under the new covenant, sealed in the blood of Christ, love is the theme. It's the theme of the New Testament. It is a covenant of love. I want to read this one last verse from John 3, 16 and 17. And when I say that, John 3, 16, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to, I'm going to add, I'm going to define a word inside of this so that you can better understand it. The word is world. World. When the Jews of Jesus' day and of John's day, this apostle, talked about the world. They talked about the terrible, evil world. There was us, the faithful, and then there was the world, all those sinners out there. So, for God so loved the world, and in this case the word world means that filthy, wretched, angry, hateful, violent, rebellious enemy of God, while we were still sinners, God first loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the filthy, wretched, angry, violent, hateful, rebellious enemy of God. He didn't come to punish them, to put them in prison, or to send them to hell. That's not why he came even though they deserved all those things. He didn't come for that reason. But to save the filthy, wretched, angry, hateful, violent, rebellious enemy God through him. To save us through loving us. That's why he came. That's some things to think about when we're angry about injustice. I'm going to go ahead and leave it there, and then we'll have communion. Thank you.